the uncanny, the marvelous, the fantastic. Our objective today is to define and explore the uncanny. The uncanny means strange or mysterious, especially in an unsettling way. The term gained traction with Freud's 1919 essay and is comfortably associated with authors like Edgar Allan Poe. In Freud's essay, he defines the term as follows, quote, the German word unheimlich is obviously the opposite of heimlich or homely, the opposite of what is familiar, and we are tempted to conclude that what is uncanny is frightening precisely because it is not known and familiar. Naturally, not everything that is new and unfamiliar is frightening. However, the relation is not capable of inversion. Something has to be added to what is novel and unfamiliar in order to make it uncanny." End quote. William Joseph Schelling describes the uncanny or unheimlich as the name for everything that ought to have remained, secret and hidden, but has come to light. The word unheimlich is literally unhomely and usually is understood as that which is unfamiliar. Interestingly, Freud writes this essay in response to another thinker named Ernst Gentsch, who grounds the concept of the uncanny in intellectual uncertainty. Gentsch describes the storytelling process and explains that, quote, one of the most effective ways to create uncanny effects is to leave the reader in uncertainty whether a particular figure in the story is a human being or an automaton and to do it in such a way that his attention is not focused directly upon his uncertainty, so that he may not be led to go into the matter and clear it up immediately." End quote. What this suggests is that the uncanny is a subtle but persuasive current underneath the surface of the story. In examining the concept of the uncanny, we learn there is an inherent delicacy that accompanies the use of this term. Freud's point that he makes at the beginning of his essay is that everything that is new or novel is not necessarily uncanny. In order for the uncanny to make your hair stand on end, this strange or unfamiliar aspect needs to be surrounded by what is familiar. Andrew Bennett and Nicholas Royal elaborate on this strange paradox. Quote, the uncanny has to do with a sense of strangeness, mystery, or eeriness. More particularly, it concerns a sense of unfamiliarity, which appears at the very heart of the familiar, or else a sense of familiarity, which appears at the very heart of the unfamiliar. The uncanny is not just a matter of the weird or spooky, but has to do more specifically with a disturbance of the familiar. Such a disturbance might be hinted at by way of the word familiar itself. Familiar goes back to the Latin familia, or family. End quote. There is arguably nothing more familiar than family and the idea of home, which is why our current articulation of the uncanny points back to, to both the German and Latin linguistic origins to communicate its fullest meaning of home and family or what is unhomely and unfamiliar. What Freud points out in his essay is the necessity for the environment or circumstances to be familiar with only an element of the unfamiliar. There is a rich paradox in the idea that what is uncanny and strange rests in what is familiar or what is known. For Freud, naturally, this boils down to repression. That which is unfamiliar but was once familiar he calls the token of repression. According to Bennett and Royal, there are 13 different forms they propose the uncanny can take, much of which they gather from Freud and Gentsch, and all of which can be useful in analyzing the literature in this course. Repetition can take the form of a feeling, situation, event, or character, and might manifest as deja vu or a double or doppelganger. Odd coincidences or the sense that something is fated to happen.
animism, which is giving life to a lifeless object. Anthropomorphism, which is giving human characteristics to an animal. Automatism, which is when a human act is mechanical, like in sleepwalking, epileptic fits, trance states, madness, or dream reading. Gender confusion or uncertainty about one's sexual identity, specifically in whether a person is male or female. Fear of being buried alive, enclosed, or confined. Silence. Telepathy, when others can read your thoughts and your thoughts are no longer your own. Death, because the concept is both familiar and inevitable, and unfamiliar, unthinkable, and unimaginable. The death drive, which suggests everyone is driven by a desire to die, which stands in opposition to living, progressing, and developing. Ghosts because they unsettle distinctions between being alive and dead, the real and the unreal, the familiar and the unfamiliar. Language, because the uncanny exists in the gap of what is known and unknown, familiar and unfamiliar, and because there is no ontological link between language and reality, but the only reason language works is because everyone pretends there is. The uncanny is one of the richest literary concepts because literature hinges on what is both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. Next, we'll look at the ways the uncanny differs from the marvelous.